Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I've shared with you before, I'm not much of a gardener. But Pastor Poppy and Cinda left for us at our home a variety of different plants and flowers to adorn our yard. And so while I'm not much of a gardener, I've tried my best, and with Tabitha's help, to at least keep them looking nice, trying to distinguish the weeds from, you know, the plants you want to keep. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between the two, quite honestly. But despite my mm, lack of skill and experience, these flowers are really starting to bloom and are quite beautiful. I haven't had to do very much at all. The God, God has blessed us with abundant rain, and so these plants and flowers have taken off. We have some hydrangeas. We've had some roses. We've had uh, this trumpet vine that's growing up the side of our house that I've had to trim back because it's kind of getting in the driveway. We even have this little patch of cactus around by the front door. I didn't know cactus grew in Wisconsin. I'm used to seeing it out in California and Nevada. But anyway, about a month ago, it had these beautiful yellow flowers on it. We did plant a few things. We put a little garden together, and one of the things we planted was a pumpkin, and this pumpkin has taken off. I mean, it is just across the whole width of the backyard, which isn't that big, but still. But every morning, I've noticed there are these beautiful orange like flowers that open up. Again, I had very little, if anything, to do with this. God designed it all. He provided the flowers through Pastor Poppy. He provided the rain, and yet they just took off and grew. Well, Jesus, the master storyteller that he is, uses these kinds of examples from nature to remind us that if he does this for the flowers or for the birds and other animals, takes care of them, how much more will he do for us, as I shared with the children? We who are the capstone of God's creation, we who alone were made in the image and likeness of God, we who alone that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, suffered and died on the cross to pay for our sins. And so Jesus tells his disciples and us in our gospel lesson this morning, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon, one of the great kings of Israel, the son of David. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these lilies of the field. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you, of little faith? The answer, of course, is yes. God will clothe and provide for us. Yet Jesus rightly calls us people of little faith. We all struggle with faith, don't we? It's easy to say that God will provide for you when you have lots of money in the bank. It's harder when the bank account is empty. That's why the writer of the Hebrews spends so much time talking about faith in his epistle, in our epistle lesson for today. He begins by telling us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
we can't always see God's provision or it doesn't come as quickly as we might like and so we grow anxious and worried and our faith suffers and struggles. I think that's why under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writer of the book of Hebrews spends so much time talking about the people of old, the saints of old, and how God worked through them to provide not only for them, but for the people of Israel and even for us today, so that as we hear their life and story, we can find comfort and inspiration and strength for our own life today. Take, for example, Noah. It says in verse 7 of our epistle, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Think about Noah. The ridicule and scorn he must have faced when he started building this ark. I know some of you have been to the ark encounter in northern Kentucky, and you got to see a replica of it firsthand. This thing was huge. 450 feet long. That's like a, what, a football field and a half? in length, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Imagine the scorn he must have faced from his neighbors as he searched for years and years building this ark when there's not a drop of rain in sight. And yet he did so in obedience to God. In reverent fear, he constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Or as one more example, take Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was the great patriarch of the people of Israel. God had promised Abraham that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him, that the Messiah, the Savior, would come from him, from his lineage, from one of his descendants. And yet there was one problem. His wife, Sarah, was barren. Abraham was 75 years old when God first promised him that he would have a son. He was 100 years old when this promise was fulfilled. Sarah was 90. And yet they believed, and as we heard, Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Or again, in our epistle, it says that by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, namely Abraham, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These and the other saints of old believed in the Lord and in his promises, and it was counted to them as righteousness. And yet, I think it's fair to say that even they at times struggled with faith and in believing these promises of God. For example, did you know that the name Isaac, the son born to Abraham and Sarah, in Hebrew means he laughs? He was named Isaac because when Abraham and Sarah heard this promise that they would have a son, they laughed. They couldn't believe it. It seemed too good to be true. And yet it was true. We have a hard time believing these things as well at times. And it doesn't help that we live in a world, and there's even some within the greater church, who cast doubt on these stories, these true stories of the Old Testament and of the Bible. It seems too far-fetched to believe that Noah would build this ark. This seems like the stuff of fairy tale. And yet, if you ever have those questions or 
someone presents them to you and tries to ridicule you for your belief in the Bible, ask yourself this. What's more difficult to believe? That God would save Noah and his household by means of an ark or that God would save the world by becoming a man. And not just by becoming a man, but by suffering and dying on the cross for you and for me and for all. And yet, my friends, that's exactly what God did in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The greatest miracle of the Christian faith, or one of them anyways, is that God became man. We call this the incarnation to save us. As I think about the incarnation, I get these different ideas that pop through my head, and one of them was a song from about 25 years ago. Maybe some of you remember it. It was called One of Us by Joan Osborne. And the refrain of the song goes like this. What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? Now, I wouldn't call God a slob, of course. But God did become one of us in his son, Jesus Christ. And while Jesus was here on earth in his ministry, he wasn't a stranger on the bus, but he was a stranger in this world. St. John writes in the beginning of his gospel, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. My friends, you were born a child of God, reborn a child of God in the waters of holy baptism by which the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you, making your body his temple so that you might believe in Jesus and receive his salvation. In baptism, you were clothed, as it were, not with the things of this world that are here today and gone tomorrow, things that thieves can destroy and and moths can destroy, but rather you were clothed, clothed with the things of heaven, the robe of Christ's righteousness that covers all your sins. You were baptized into Jesus' death for your sins, including those times when you doubt and fear and are worried and anxious. You were baptized into Jesus' death for your sins, and then you were raised to new life with him in his resurrection. My friends, you, by faith in Jesus, are a child of God. You are one of his sheep. You are a member of his flock. You are his sheep, and he is your shepherd. He is the good shepherd, the one who laid down his life for you and then took his life back up again so that you would be his forever. And now, as your good shepherd, Jesus provides and cares for you. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies, namely sin, death, and the devil. We're at this table. Jesus feeds you with himself, with his very body and blood to forgive your sins and strengthen your faith. All this is why Jesus says to us in our gospel today, not to be anxious or worried, but to trust in him, to believe in him even when there are so many things in this world that can cause us to be afraid. Jesus says, Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. 
Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God is not ashamed to be called your God, for he has prepared for you a city, a heavenly city, in which you will be blessed and nourished forever. My friends, Jesus, who died for you and rose again, promises that he will take care of you now in this life until that day when as your good shepherd he picks you up, puts you over his shoulders and carries you home. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.